Welcome to the last of our ongoing series of videos on structural analysis. This is from chapter three. We've now moved to section three, dealing with internal resisting moments. Here we have a truss with a series of point forces on joints of the truss on the top. And uh, it's a square bay truss in the sense that the depth of the truss is dimension S and each of these bays between joints is distance S. And we'll talk about trusses in more detail in chapter seven, but each of these joints can be called a joint, a vertex, or a panel point. And I will use those terms pretty much interchangeably because they're used all out, all through the literature on this subject matter. Um, we would imagine that whatever uniform load that would exist between these points uh, amounts to a total force of P, a half a P of which goes to that joint and a half a P to that joint. And then all the distributed load that might exist between these two points gets divided equally between that joint and that joint. In other words, this joint gets a half a P force from this bay and a half a P from that. So we have a one P force on each of these interior joints and only a half a P force on the end joints. This is a 19 bay truss. There's a one P force from every bay. So that means there's 19 P total downward force. Or in other words, there are 18 of these one P forces and two of the half P forces for a total of 19 P downward. That means the reactions at each end have to be half of that 19 P, or in other words, <clears throat> nine and a half P. Now, if we've already learned about the equations of equilibrium, we know, for example, that if this truss is in equilibrium, the sum of all the vertical forces has to be zero. The sum of all the horizontal forces has to be zero and the sum of all the external moments has to be zero. There are no external moments applied to this. This is assumed to be a pin joint. This is a roller joint. We've represented them with the point forces that they could have, which is an upward 9.5 P force. Because there are no applied horizontal forces, there are no horizontal reactions indicated. And furthermore, since all the supports are either pin joints or roller joints. There's no external moments either applied to this or that would result from some sort of reaction at the supports. Now, we know that this overall truss needs to be in equilibrium if we're to provide a satisfactory structure. Um, We'd really like to understand something about what's going on internal, though, because we know that um, internal stresses are what are going to fail this truss. And uh, unfortunately, right now, our rules are that we have equilibrium applicable to all the external forces. So in other words, as long as we take it, the truss as a whole, we can't understand anything about what's going on internal to it. We can simply calculate external forces or external reactions. However, we know if the truss is in equilibrium, we know that every sub portion of the truss is, is in equilibrium, which means if we want to know what's going on internal to the truss, we can basically take part of the truss, where the slice point to create that free body, as we're going to call it, is a location of interest to us. So for example, we know one of the most common places that a beam or a truss under uniform load is likely to fail is at the center of the truss. So we can create a free body by going to the center of the truss and slicing it in this manner along this dashed line. And then we create a free body out of the left end of the overall truss, which we've now drawn down here. 
What we have to do though is we have to, when we throw this portion of the truss away, we have to replace it by whatever its effect was. So the question becomes, what can be happening in these members? And we're not going to get into this in too much detail now, but we know that if these are, if this is a true pure truss, these are pin joints and therefore any force along this member that's perpendicular to the member would cause it to rotate around that point. So we know that the only way for that individual member to be in equilibrium is that there either has to be a force in this direction causing it to be in compression or a force in the other direction causing it to be in tension. We're going to assume that there's a compressive force on the top. So we're drawing it to the left and this force H is the force at that, at that juncture in this member due to the portion of this truss that we've removed now. We also know from equilibrium that if there's a horizontal force to the left on this member, there has to be a horizontal force of equal magnitude to the right, in other words, magnitude H, um, in order that the object would remain in equilibrium. So here we have these two equal and opposite forces. We haven't actually proven that they're yet, there yet, but they could be there. So we're drawing the arrow, we're giving them a symbol, which in this case is H for horizontal force. And now we're going to apply our mathematics and figure out whether there really is a force there. So we're going to take this free body and we're going to say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine P forces. And we know that they are equally spaced. So we know where the center of action of them is going to be. The center of action is going to be along this line right here. In other words, four vertices points in or four bays in rather. And so to make life easy on ourselves, we're going to do this. We're going to combine those nine P forces and put them right there. This is perfectly legitimate as it's applied just to this free body. Clearly we cannot replace those nine P forces on the overall truss and redo the mathematics and have it make any sense. It only works for this particular free body for the purposes of determining what these horizontal forces might be. But from an equilibrium point of view, it's absolutely valid to replace those nine 1P forces with a 9P force at the center of action. We did not include this 0.5P because it's, it would make the distribution non-uniform and we wouldn't know where the center of action was. And our whole point in combining those 9P forces was to simply reduce our mathematics and make it simpler and thereby reduce the likelihood that we're going to make some sort of mathematical error. We didn't have to replace those 9 1P forces with a 9P force. We did it to make life simpler. If we tried to throw in this half P force with them, we wouldn't be making life simpler. We'd actually be making it more complicated. So keep in mind what the motive is for making each of these changes. Now we can also uh, combine this half P force with this 9.5 P force because they are along the same line of action. The half P force is downward. The 9.5 P force is upward. The net effect is a 9 P upward force. So we end up with this free body where we have a 9 P downward force and a 9P upward force. Those two things are separated from each other by a distance of 5S. They are two equal and opposite forces. They cancel each other out in terms of the sum of the vertical forces, but they do not cancel each other out in terms of moment because they don't have the same line of action. So the two of them are tending to produce a moment which is 9P times the lever arm 5S. 
And that happens to be the same moment about every point in the universe because we proved that a pure couple produces the same moment about every point in the universe. For our purposes though, we're going to do this sort of mathematical process in a grind it out, crunch it out way. We're going to take moments about that point right there, end A, and we're going to say the sum of the moments about end A is this 9P, which is going through point A. So it has a zero lever arm or zero S. So it's plus 9P. We don't care whether it's plus or minus because it's zero anyway because the lever arm is zero. It's not tending to create either a counterclockwise or a clockwise moment. This 9P force though is tending to produce a clockwise moment about this end. So it's plus 9P times the lever arm which is 5S. That's the perpendicular distance from point A to the line of action of this 9P force. And then finally, about point A, this H force along the bottom has a zero lever arm, and that should have been included in the equation here, but I left it out. Um, but it is H times the zero S. This force, on the other hand, is if we extend its line of action, its perpendicular distance from that line of action to this point about which we're calculating moments is this vertical dimension, which is 1s. That force is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about point A. So we write minus h times its lever arm, which is 1s. This term goes to zero. We're left with 45 PS is equal to HS, or in other words, H is equal to plus 45P. So that plus 45 means that we um, assumed the correct direction when we drew that arrow, indicating that there was a compressive force in the top chord. One of the things I want you to notice is that the horizontal forces here are much larger than the vertical forces. Second thing I want you to know, and that's because of the proportions of this truss, which is uh, 19 times longer than its depth, so we're giving better lever arms to the vertical forces than to the horizontal forces, and the horizontal forces have to work harder to make up for that. Normally we would say that's not a very smart structure, we don't want to be amplifying forces. However, when the forces are not terribly large, and they often aren't, and when we're trying to save vertical dimension in the building, which we often are, and when we're using super high strength materials like modern steels, it turns out that we can easily use trusses that are 19 times as long as their depth and still have very tolerable forces that we're going to be resisting with the top and bottom cords. So we are at a mechanical disadvantage because we chose proportions where the truss was 19 times as long as it was deep. But again, from a practical point of view, that's often about the realm we want to be in. And we've been saying, in fact, that if we're going to just grab a number for the proper proportions of a truss, the truss depth would be about 1 20th of the truss span. But when you do this, you need to understand you are having this amplification effect where these vertical forces are causing much larger horizontal forces in these cord members. This, these two H forces, by the way, which uh, I couldn't scale them right, if this is 9P, and keep in mind I started off drawing P at some particular length, and that set the scale, and then when I drew it as 9P, it got larger, and then when I draw this horizontal force, it is so long in proportion that I had to kind of curl it around on itself like this uh, in order to get its full scale there. So this dash portion is not real, it's just saying that point wants to go there and I could have just probably reduced this down 
Um, but uh, once I got started, I just stuck with this scale. Okay, so if we do a 20 bay truss and we want to know what's happening at one of these interior trusses, we can go slice it right through here and create a free body. So that's what we've done. And then we said the portion of the truss that we threw away is creating a compression force on the top, a tensile force on the bottom. And now we have a diagonal web member there that actually has some action in it. So we're going to represent its force as D. And since we don't know what its force is, we're going to draw it as if it's in tension. Uh, and again, we could have made this force in the positive direction and given it a name like top chord force. And we could have drawn this in the positive direction and called it the bottom chord force. And we would have solved all our equations and discovered that the one on the bottom is truly in tension, but the one on the top would have given us a negative number implying that even though we drew it to the right, it would actually be to the left. But because this is such a common situation, we know we got compression in the top, we know we have tension in the bottom, we're drawing those the way they actually are. And it turns out we drew D in the actual direction it's going to turn out to be. So all of these are going to solve with positive answers, meaning yes, the vectors are in the direction we originally drew them in. Okay, so now we're going to redraw this truss, and we, we're doing two things here. Um, one is we're combining all of these P forces. So we've got nine P forces again um, with a center of action right here. And then we can also combine this 0.5 P force with the 10 P force to leave us a nine and a half P upward force. So when we do that, we have nine and a half P. We have 9P here, and again we have C, T, and D representing the action of the portion of the truss that we threw away on the portion of the truss that we've decided to retain. We're going to pick two points, Q1 and Q2, to take moments about. And again, the choice of points about which we take moments is informed by our own desire to make our lives simple, which means we're going to pick points every time that eliminate as many unknowns as possible. So the two crucial points are Q1, which is an intersection of the line of action of the force D and the line of action of the force C. And then the other point is Q2, which is the intersection of the line of action of vector D and the line of action of vector t. So if we take the sum of the moments about point q1, um, we get 9.5p times 9s. So that's 9.5p times the perpendicular distance from that line of action out to the point q1 about which we're taking moments. That force is tending to produce clockwise moments about q1. So there's a plus sign here that's implicit. We didn't draw it explicitly, but we should have to designate a positive moment. So it's plus 9.5p times the lever arm 9s, which is this perpendicular distance between q1 and the line of action of that force. Then we have 9p, which is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment. So we put a minus sign on it, minus 9p times its lever arm, which is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the 9p force to the point Q1, which is 4s, where s is the dimension of a bay. And then finally, around this point, we have no force, no moment from C, because the line of action of C goes through that point. We have no moment from D, because its line of action goes through that point. And so rather than write those in with their zero lever arm, I just left them out. But I do have to account for force T. Its line of action is vertically displaced from Q1 by distance S. In other words, this is the perpendicular distance, which has value S. 
So MT is tending to produce counterclockwise moments about point Q1. So we put minus for counterclockwise, T for the magnitude of the force, and its lever arm is 1S, which turns out to be uh, the vertical depth of the truss. When we solve for T, we can put it over on the other side and it becomes plus. We have 9.5 times 9 uh, minus 9 times 4S. So when we run all that mathematics, we end up with 49.5P. Now it's worth noting when we had a 19 to 1 ratio between the length and the depth, um, we had a smaller force of 45. Now we're up to 49.5P when we jump to a 20 bay truss. It's a pretty sensitive function. If you double the length of the truss, you quadruple this force. Similarly, we take the sum of the moments about Q2. So that's this point right here. Again, we have the 9.5P force tending to produce a clockwise moment about Q2. The force is, so it's plus 9.5P times the lever arm, which is the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the force to the point Q2 about which we're taking moments. And that happens to be 10S. So we put 10S right here. Then the 9P force is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about Q2. So we put a minus for counterclockwise. The magnitude of the force is 9P. And the lever arm is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the 9P force to the point Q2, which happens to be 5S. Finally, about this point, neither T nor D produces a moment because both those forces go through that point, but C does produce a moment, which happens to be counterclockwise, so it's negative, and we write minus the magnitude of the force, which is C, times its lever arm, which is 1S, which happens to be the perpendicular distance from the line of action of C down to the point Q2 about which we're taking moments. When we solve that equation, we get C equals to plus 50P. In both these cases, we got plus, meaning, yes, those forces are in the direction in which we drew them. So this compressive force to the left is truly a compressive force. This tensile force to the right truly is a tensile force and the mathematics is informing us that in fact that is the case. Now we can sum all of our, all of our vertical forces. Um, so we get 9.5 P is an upward force, minus 9 P is a downward force, and then dy has to be downward because we drew d down and to the right. So we have minus dy equals zero. And when we solve, we get, this should have been a subscript, um, y. We get dy is equal to plus 0.5p. That plus means, yes, d is in the direction in which we've drawn it. Okay, so w we just talked about trusses and the fact that you can slice through the center of the truss and you can draw a horizontal force here and a horizontal force there and they represent a force couple um, that keeps this structure stable uh, and that we call that the internal resisting moment. And by the way, it's, it's really crucial to understand that when we slice this free body, um, and we represent this distributed load W by its net reaction. We have offset the vertical forces. So the vertical forces, which are the loads, are creating a moment problem for us. And we need this internal uh, moment to resist the moment of the vertical forces. So the moment of the horizontal forces has got to resist the moment of the vertical forces. And they're really easy to visualize here. We have an upward reaction. 
we have a downward force that represents the effect of this distributed load. And these are equal and opposite. They represent a pure couple. Likewise, we have equal and opposite horizontal forces that represent a pure couple. And, and they're easy to see. One is right above the other. Sometimes, though, we can have force couples that are slid laterally or offset from each other. So if we take this tension member, for example, in order for it to work, it's got to have a horizontal component at each of the ends. Um, and we slice through the center of it. Here we have a horizontal force here. There we have a horizontal force. They are offset by the depth of D, which we sometimes refer to this as the, the sag of the tension member. If you don't have sag, it won't work. You cannot have a loaded tensile member that's perfectly flat. It will develop a curvature if there's a load on it because it can't function effectively without doing that. Uh, you can't have a horizontal couple without a lever arm between them. So here we have the line of action of one of those horizontal forces. Here we have the line of action of the other and the vertical spacing is the lever arm for that force couple. Likewise, for arches, we'll have a horizontal buttressing force here. We'll have a compressive force at the top. These two forces equilibrate each other and they have a lever arm and they together represent the internal resisting moment. If we give a tensile member half the sag, the lever arm becomes half as much and the horizontal forces have to become twice as large to compensate. So you can approach flatness here, but you do it at the cost of drastic increases in these horizontal forces, which means drastic increases in the tension in the, the tensile member. There are more complete explanations of all this in the assigned readings in the textbook, but this hits the highlights of what you need to understand about internal resisting moments. We will get into all of this in much more detail in chapter six on beams, and then in chapter seven on trusses, and finally in chapter eight on compression members, and chapter nine on tension members. That ends our discussion of internal resisting moments from section three of chapter three.